Lord God, thank you for giving us the opportunity to study your word tonight and to see the, the things that your word has told us for our comfort uh, as we look at the last times and, and what will happen at the end. Uh, help us to find peace knowing that you are in control and that you will take us to be with you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so we are on chapter 11. Any questions from any of the uh, the previous ones? All right. Well, if any pop up, let me know. Chapter 11 is kind of a, uh, uh, you see the title there, Assorted Topics, kind of a potpourri, um, a variety of things. There's a bunch in here, much of it, We've talked about already because you guys have asked questions about one thing or another. We've touched on it, but I have this one in here just to make sure that if we haven't talked about it, we get a chance to, to talk about some of these things. And so, uh, and and so, we'll kind of move through it. But if there's something that you see or that I say or that we talk about that you say, wait a second, let's spend some time on that. I'm more than happy to do that. So the the first thing is the last things. You know what happens when someone dies, right? The last thing in every human life is death. What, what does that mean? And you think about over the years, people have had different definitions for death. Um, you know, way back in the day, it was a mirror. And if you put a mirror in front of their face and it didn't fog up, they were dead. Now we've kind of figured out, hey, you can get them breathing, right? Or or then it was the, the heartbeat, right? If there's no pulse, then they're dead. Well, CPR and the AED and everything else, uh, you can start that. Now they kind of talk about brainwave activity. There's no brainwave activity. They're, they're dead. Who knows? Um, but when the Bible talks about death, it doesn't talk about some physical specificity as far as when life ends. It talks about separation. And, and the Bible uses that word death in three different contexts. So physical death, when the soul and body separate, and that's the, the first verse there. Do you want to read that one, Zibra? Yes. It's yep. The dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God. The air. Okay, if someone dies, the body returns to dust. God formed us out of dust, we decompose. The spirit of the believer goes to God. The spirit of the unbeliever goes to, to hell. We will talk about that. Um, and in Luke 23, Jesus speaking to the thief on the cross tells him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He doesn't talk about a long wait, but today. So when we die, there's that separation. Uh, Stephen, when he was being killed, um, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So the, the, the soul and body separate. Um, the Bible also talks about uh, a spiritual death is when someone is separated from God. Um, and then eternal death is when you combine spiritual death and physical death, right? That, that forever. Um, so, last thing that happens is death, unless Jesus comes first. If we're still alive when he returns, um, we'll be caught together in the air, all that kind of stuff. So, that'll be good. Um, the Bible talks about Jesus coming twice uh, to Advent. That's what that arrival coming of Christ. The first one, as a baby, he came to be born, to live for us, to die for us. Uh, and then he promised that he would come a second time. And when the Bible talks about that second coming of Christ, it, it connects it to the end of the world, uh, the end of this world that, as we know it. Um, there are a lot of different teachings out there about the return of Christ. Uh, a lot of times people will look at the book of Revelation, which is a, a vision. It's apocalyptic literature. It gives images to help us understand concepts. It's not giving specific details. Um, you know, the, 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 the dragon and the beast and the chain and all of that. It, it, it's, it's very vivid pictures that help us understand the truth. Um, not that the devil is actually a physical dragon, but that picture is used to depict him. Uh, or, you know, since the Bible tells us that the devil is spirit, what's a chain going to do to him? You know, if that's, if that's a physical thing. So we're, we're talking... Visionary stuff. A lot of people look at Revelation and, and they try to pinpoint very specific things that it doesn't necessarily tell us. And when they do that, they ignore some of the things that God's word really clearly says. You know, in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus' disciples asked him, what's it going to be like at the end? Uh, how's, how's it going to end? What's going to happen? 
and he gives very clear answers. Um, so the way to understand what God's word says about the last time is to take those clear answers that he gives and let that guide our understanding and let those pictures um, fill in some of the uh, uh, the image, you know, what, what's going on. Um, so Revelation, uh, the Apostle John, so he was the last living apostle. Uh, he was in exile on the island of Patmos uh, in 95, 96, somewhere in there. Um, and he had been sent there because he was proclaiming Christ. And they didn't want to kill him because he was such a loved pastor that they figured that would cause more problems. So they sent him into exile. And so here he is separated from his churches that he had been leading for decades. And uh, um, the churches were being persecuted. And, and he was suffering from the fact that he's separated from them. Uh, and, and then Jesus appears to him and says, I, I want to show you what's really going on and what will go on so that you can have comfort. And I want you to write it down so that you can give comfort to those people too. Um, and I think a lot of people look at Revelation and say, oh, scary. But really, it's God saying, hey, I know the world's getting rough, and it's going to get rougher. Um, and, and, and the end is going to be a big thing, but Jesus wins, and believers win. That's the message of Revelation. And it looks at that same scene from you know seven different angles, really, uh, as you go through um, but I say all that to say there's a lot of different thoughts out there. You know, some people say, well, first Jesus is going to come and he's secretly going to take away all the believers and leave the unbelievers. There's going to be a thousand years and then and then there's going to be this battle and then this will happen and then he'll come again and then a little bit later he'll come again. Um, and there's all sorts of disagreements on when those different comings of Christ are. Whereas you look at the passages and it talks about Jesus coming at the end. Uh, when will it take place? Well, we don't know. You know, all of these passages, uh, um, you know, Acts 17, God has set a day, uh, Mark 13, no one knows about that day. Um, if someone tells you, oh, the last day is going to be October 17th of 2025, um, you know they're, they're messing with you because God says we're not going to know. Um, Second Peter, it will come like a thief. You know, if, if you knew exactly when and where the thief were coming, he wouldn't get away with anything. Um, but it'll be a surprise. Uh, so we don't know when it will come, but you turn the page and, and you get that list of signs for when it's coming soon. Because the disciples said, what are the signs going to be? How, how are we going to know it's coming soon? And in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, there's long sections about this, but I kind of summarize those signs uh, into these things. One, false prophets will deceive many. There will be wars and rumors of war. There will be famines and earthquakes. There will be intense persecution against Christians. Wickedness will increase. Love will decrease. And the gospel will be preached in all the world. Uh, so those are the things Jesus says. When you see those things, be ready because I'm coming soon. You look at that list and what thoughts do you have? Well, false prophets. Seems like that's already happened. Yeah. All of these things, right? Yeah. Famines, earthquakes, yeah. persecution. Um, yes. Yeah. And and Jesus said, when you see these, be ready. How are we ready? Through faith. You know, he's the one that's preparing our place. He's the one that, that has made us ready to uh, face judgment because we stand with his perfection on our record instead of instead of our sins. Um, Second Timothy is one of those summary passages. You know, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud. You look through that and say, oh yeah, that's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, so he's coming soon. Again, what is soon? Soon is not necessarily my definition of soon, but but at the perfect time, God, Jesus will return. How will he return? Like I said, there are some out there that teach that it's going to be a a secret first return, and then a, a bigger second return. Um, but when the Bible describes it, it always talks about it in a very public way. Um, Gary, you want to read Revelation 1-7? Oh, yes, it says, Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierce him. And all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Okay. And 
every eye will see him. You know, there's passages that talk about the trumpet sounding and the, the lightning flashing from the east to the west. And, and every, I mean, if he's coming secretly, he's the worst to keep it secret. Um, you know, this is a public thing. Uh, you know, when the Son of Man comes in glory, all the angels with him, we're not going to miss that. Um, so he'll return. And then what does he do? Well, the judgment. Um, but first, he raises everybody. He gets everybody together. Um, in John 5, uh, Jesus says, the time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. So all of the dead will be right, will be raised. Those of the good will rise to live. Those of the evil will rise to be condemned. Uh, Hebrews 9, it is death and commanded I once and then to face judgment. So after death comes judgment. Uh, Philippians 3, he talks about how he, uh, the second verse, verse 21 there says, by the power that enables him to bring everything under our control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they'll be like his glorious bodies. So he gives us these resurrected bodies, these glorious bodies. Uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, we're, we're at the, at, in a flash and the twinkling of an eye will be changed. Um, really the only example of a glorified body that we've seen is when Jesus rose from the dead, right? And he, he could appear in, in the room uh, without with the doors being locked. Uh, and, and yet, he said, look, I've got flesh and bones. He could eat. He could, I mean, uh, basically, we have our definition of it by the negatives, where he says it, it won't wear out. Uh, it'll be immortal. It won't get sick. It won't, you know. So these perfect bodies we'll have. And then the judgment. Um, we've got Matthew 25. Uh, Edwin, you want to play your pass on that? Oh, okay, Victor, you want to read that one? You said Matthew 25? Yep. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay. Um, how hard is it for a shepherd to tell which are sheep and which are goats? It's obvious. Um, I think a lot of people think about Judgment Day and are looking for a, a surprise, like, like uh, who I wonder where I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> but uh, but as, as God's word describes it, believers can know where they're going to go, right? We know that because Jesus said that, paid for our sins, we are going to be in heaven with him. Um, and unbelievers, well, if they're not trusting in Jesus, what they've done hasn't cut it. And you think of those who have been dead for a thousand years when judgment day comes. Those who have been in hell for a thousand years know exactly what their judgment is. Those who have been in heaven know exactly what their judgment is. It's not so much a surprise. It's this public declaration. You know, uh, in Philippians, it talks about how every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of God the Father. Even those who pierced him, right? Even those who reject him will have to say, you know what? He's right. Yeah, you know, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about we'll all appear before the judgment seat. Mark 16 tells us the basis on which that judgment will be made. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned to stay. Those who believe to heaven, those who don't, not. Uh, John 3, uh, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Second Thessalonians, uh, he will punish those who don't know God, who don't obey the gospel of our Lord. Uh, any questions on his return or judgment or any of that stuff? Okay, then you've got that question there. What is heaven? Little kid comes up to you and asks, what's heaven? How do you answer that? Paradise. Paradise, yeah. So it's Hawaii. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it comes to India. There you go. There you go. I've never been to Hawaii, so I wouldn't. Oh. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we have ideas of really great places but uh you know that's the thing about heaven it's hard to describe because it's so far beyond anything we've experienced 
a lot of the pictures the Bible uses are just taking the best thing people grasp and saying hey, it's going to be the ultimate of that, right? So, so a feast, a banquet. Um, in those days, just about every meal was, unless you were really wealthy and most people weren't, was some bread and some water and some wine. That was the meal. Um, to have meat, well, that was a, a big day when the fat calf was slaughtered and and you know there was something going on. What are we celebrating, right? Um, and and so he talks about heaven being this this wonderful feast where there's all kinds of food and all the things that you only bring out at special times. And it's like that all the time. Or or you think about uh, boy, a garden is really nice where you've got the plants and, and fruit and all of that. And, and he says, well, it's like it's like a garden with you know a river running through it, and you've got trees on both sides of the river, and they're producing fruit twelve months a year, not just you know so. He takes the best thing we can think of and say, or a city, you know, city, that's where you're safe. And okay, this city has walls that are impossibly high and, and the, the gates are made of pearls and the streets are gold. And, the, you know, so he takes these things and says, this is how, it, but in our minds, we can't fully fathom it. Um, the, the one that really speaks to me is the one that describes what won't be there. Uh, Revelation 21, right in the middle there. Um, you guys might not be in the same order on the screen as I've got you, but I'll go by what's on my screen. So Shelby, you want you want the Revelation 21 passage? Yes. Um he will wipe oh, yeah. he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Okay, that one I get. Because I know what mourning and crying and pain and those things are, and that's just all gone. Um, right, yeah. Uh, you, you look at some of those other ones. The the first one there, Philippians one, it's better by far. First Corinthians thirteen. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Right? We have we have all these questions of God that we're going to totally understand them. Um, first John three, when he appears, we'll be like him. Uh, we'll see him as he is. Psalm sixteen, the joy in his presence. We read the Revelation twenty one, uh, Revelation fourteen. They will rest from their labor. Revelation 7, he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. The picture of that perfect protection. Um, Romans 8, top of the next page, I consider that our present suffering aren't worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. We can get really caught up on the things that are going wrong. And he says, you're not going to be thinking about that stuff because heaven is, is so much greater. And so you've got the question then, since Christ did all of this, what's left for us to do? Why am I still here? I'm a believer. It'd be way better to just go to heaven and be with God forever. Um, but God still has me here. And, and that's what, you know, these passages, Philippians 1, Paul was writing about how he was about to go to trial. He didn't know if he was going to be put to death or not. Um, and, and he said, you know, it'd be better off if I die because then I could be with God. But while I'm here, for to me, to live is Christ. It's all about Jesus. In Acts 1, Jesus told his disciples, I'm leaving. Uh, I'm going, going to the to the my spot in, on the throne. Um, but you will be my witnesses. Uh, Revelation 2, he says, be faithful. He was point of that. David, you want to read 2 Peter 3? Yes, sorry. 2 Peter 3. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. While we're here, our life is about growing in the, the grace and knowledge. So the knowledge, learning more and more about him. And grace, the understanding his love for me more so that I can show that love for others more. And how do I grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus? Well, how does any relationship grow? Communication, right? Uh, if, if there's a, a couple that never talks, that's not going to go well. Um, if only one side talks, they're missing something. Um, but God has given us the privilege of communicating with him. And that's where the next two parts come in. Bible study and prayer. So Bible study, that's God talking to us, right? It's his word. Prayer is us talking to God. Um, and I think a lot of this stuff in Bible study we've talked about because questions have come up, right? You know, so the, the, the first one, who wrote the Bible? How would you answer that one? Okay. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, James. Okay. Prophets. Moses. 
Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Okay. So just a bunch of dudes. Well, from through the Holy Spirit. Okay. So yeah, God used human writers to write, but ultimately it's his message, right? Um, you know, the uh, if there were just a bunch of individuals writing, it wouldn't be this this beautifully uh, connected and and uh, uh, completely correct thing that we have with the prophecies and the fulfillment of prophecy and all of that. Uh, but but look at what it, what the Bible says about it. You know, Jesus speaking to his Father, prays, sanctify them by the truth. So sanctify, make them holy by the truth. That's the the power he gives us for that. And then he says what the truth is. Your word is true. Uh, I skipped a part there. Yeah, so 2 Peter 1, uh, up above, uh, prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful. 1 Corinthians, words taught by the Spirit, expressing mm -hmm. spiritual truths and spiritual words. Wow. And so since it's from God, we can call it true. Um, you know, Romans 15, everything that was written in the past was written to teach you. The Bible isn't here to be a code book we need to break. It's it's something that that clearly tells us what God has to say to us. 2 like Timothy 3, it makes you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Parts of the Bible, you got the Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament written before Jesus came, Old, uh, New Testament written after he died and rose and ascended. Um Old Testament in Hebrew, 39 books. New Testament, Greek, 27 books. Uh, translations, we've talked about this, all sorts of translations out there. Uh, the, the beauty is um, God's given us his word, and he had it written in Hebrew for the Old Testament, Greek for the New Testament, um, and then he's given people the wisdom and ability to, to translate that into the language that we speak so we can communicate. And different translations aim for different audiences, right? King James was translated 500 years ago for um, people speaking English. English has changed a little bit. King James has, has done some revisions and all that since then, but um, it's, it's a, a different level of English. Uh, NIV. Um, yeah, yep, yep. Uh, you know, NIV is designed, you know, for... Uh, to, to be as current of uh, English as, as can be. Uh, some of them look to be more literal with the, the Hebrew and Greek words. Some of them look to be more understandable with, with the meaning. Because anytime you go from one language to another, it's not the exact same words. Um, so like there, there's a psalm that talks about uh, uh, calling someone, I am the, I'm the, real literally, the little man of your honor. And what's that talking about, right? Um, and some translations, because those are the words, they say, little man of your eye. Um, but some translations use an idiom that we would understand. He's the apple of your eye, God. Um, you know, and you think about it, that little man, I understand what they're thinking of, because if you're looking at someone and they're looking at you, and you can see that little tiny reflection, and so he's focusing on me, right? But Apple of the eye communicates better. And so different translations make different choices on that. But, um, you know, people ask what translation should we use? Yes, right? Find one that, that you can understand and use it. There are great ones out there. We use NIV in church and in this class, um, just because I think it's a, a one that most people can connect with and understand. Um, but like in Bible study, I'll encourage people to bring whatever translation they want, read from that, and then we'll, we'll hear different translations and uh, maybe get something to talk about. If, if you are reading something and you're like, wait a second, this says this, this says that, and you have a question, ask me or Vicar. We had to study Hebrew and Greek for a really long time, so if we can make use of it, we're, we're happy to. I mean, we use it in our sermon studies and all that, but uh, uh, we're happy to answer questions. Uh, principles of Bible interpretation. A lot of people use the Bible. Uh, a lot of people use it for what they want it to say instead of what it actually says. How do we know we're being fair with what the Bible says? Um, you know, if I told you, hey, so hungry I could eat a horse, 
and you call up PETA and, and report me, hey, this guy's talking about eating horses, um, you know that's not what I was saying, right? I said those words, but that's not at all fair. We can't do that to God. Uh, it, it's important for us to, to let God's word speak as God's word speaks. So how do you do that? Well, the more you know about the background of the book of the Bible you're reading, the better. You know, is this is this written to Old Testament people? Is this written to, to people struggling with this thing or that thing? And it helps you understand what's being said there. Pay attention to the context. One of my uh, one of my pastor tricks um, when people ask me a question about the Bible and I don't have you know that particular spot memorized, and then I go, "What does this mean?" I'm like, well, let's look it up and let's look at the context because usually, if you read the verses around it, it really does help explain what it is. And and if not, um, you read the chapters around it, and and you'll get the a, a better understanding. Um, let scripture interpret scripture. We've had it in here already where their question came up and that passage sounds like it's saying this. Okay, well, let's look at where else God talks about that to help us understand what that passage says. Understand the two main teachings. We talked about law and gospel, how they seem to contradict, but actually work perfectly together. Um, and the last one's really the first. Begin by seeking the Spirit's blessing on your study. This is God's word asking to bless our study of it. Tools for Bible students. Any of those you got questions about? Uh, concordance, which would a lot of good study Bibles have all of these in them. You know, at the back, there's there's uh, the listing of the key words and what you know. So, like you know, I know there's that passage that says God so loved the world. Where do I find that? You look at the concordance. I look up world. Oh, here's all the passages with world in it. There I can find it. John three sixteen. Google does that a lot quicker today. So, um, but Concordance Bible Dictionary Bible Handbook, uh, that'll give you kind of a background of each of the, the books, Bible Atlas, Catechism, um, if you're saying, hey, what's the next thing I should get to help me study the Bible? Uh, I've got several of them on my on my counter, and if and anyone wants them, they're 20 bucks a piece, um, and uh, it's, it's basically this expanded. You know, we talked about how Luther wrote the, the small catechism to help people understand what the Bible actually says. And it goes over the Ten Commandments, it goes over the Creed, so who is God, it goes over the Lord's Prayer, so what's prayer all about, and there's a section on baptism, communion, and forgiveness. Um, and so it, it, the catechism refers to the, a question and answer type of study. So there will be a question, um, you know, who is God? Well, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does that mean? Here's what it's talking about, and then here's a bunch of passages that that. that um, so in, in your appendix in there, you've got the catechism uh, printout for the Lord's Prayer. So that's kind of what you're, you're looking at. But then um, the book on my shelf has dozens and dozens of passages that say why we say this is what. Um, and then commentaries. Uh, commentaries are books about books of the Bible, right? So you're studying Romans and, and you want to understand it better. If you get a commentary, it kind of explains each verse. Some commentaries are really good, some are awful. Depends who's writing it and what they think about God's word. Um, you want one written by someone who, who believes that this is God's word and, and, and uh, isn't trying to twist it to make it say what they want. Uh, if you're looking for some good ones, um, there's a couple of sets on the church library, and I've got more in my office. If you want to borrow one from there, let me know. Church library, you feel free to, to take um, Anytime. Uh, how do I study the Bible? Uh, first time I read cover to cover the Bible, I was a junior in college. I'm pretty sure I had read the whole Bible before that, but never all the way through. You know, I bits and pieces. Um, but I decided I'm going to read through the Bible. And so I counted up how many days were left in the year. I counted up how many pages were in my Bible. All right, four pages a day, I'll be done. Um, so every night before I went to bed, junior in college, I read my four pages of the Bible. I have to admit that there were days that my roommate would have said, hey, John, what'd you just read? The best I could have said was the Bible. Um, you know, because when you're reading something just to get through it, you don't get much out of it. Um, I've learned that if you slow down, if I ask myself questions, that helps me to get more and more out of it. So, so I put down some questions that you might ask. 
You know, what teachings are in this section? How does it lead me to confess my own sinfulness? All right, where is God's law hitting me here? Uh, what does it lead me to give thanks for? Where is God's gospel here? What, what's the good news that you got from me in this section? And for what does this lead me to pray? Uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it makes the conversation. I, I, uh, yeah, you might, some others, what does it tell me about myself? What does it tell me about God? Uh, I put the, give you a chance to try it. Luke 16, I'll let you do that on your own. Bible reading suggestions. Each year we put out the lists in the gathering area for people who want to read the whole Bible in a year. Uh, there's different ways to do it. You can just go cover to cover, but I don't know how many people have told me, you know, Pastor, I started in January reading and I read every day and I got all the way through Genesis and, you know, great stuff, all these exciting stories and Exodus, all that powerful stuff. But then you get into Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all these lists and and then I just couldn't do it anymore, so I gave up. Um, if that's going to happen to you, I'd say, then don't just go straight in order, because there are some some tough sections in there. Uh, you want to build up the habit before you get into those of saying use those to break you up. So so maybe start with uh, uh, you know one of the summaries of the life of Jesus, Mark, the shortest one, uh, Philippians, a, a short letter about the joy of being a Christian, Romans. Kind of goes through the whole, this is how salvation works in 16 chapters. And then Genesis, you get all those stories and the beginning of the world and all that. Um, and then read through the rest of the New Testament and then go back. And once you're in the habit, go through the Old Testament. Or you can do any of the other sets out there. Um, one goes chronologically. One, one has readings from different sections each day. Um, but my encouragement is to, to read your Bible. That's, that's God talking to you. Um, that's a, a powerful thing. And as we hear God speaking in his word, he wants us to be speaking to him as well. And that's where prayer comes in. Uh, let's do that question. Why pray? I have a question. Mm -hmm. What is the entire NT? <laughs> oh, sorry, New Testament. Oh, okay. Okay, New Testament. Old Testament. Okay. Yep. Sorry, Sorry, did the uh, abbreviations there. No, I, yeah. Was, yep, good. So then, then prayer, um, why pray? Hope. Hope, okay. Yeah, it builds your connection with God. Um, you know, I, you watch TV shows, and the Christian, it, it bothered me because the, the Christian is never shown as a as an actual Christian. It's shown as this caricature of a Christian. Uh, and prayer is so often shown as kind of a, a psychological exercise for me to just, you know, kind of like if you've talked to someone and, you know, they're talking for 20 minutes and you're just listening. And, and at the end, they say, oh, this was so great. I really needed to just get that off my chest. Um, that's fine. That's good. Prayer is so much more than that. Uh, it, it's not just it's not just psychologically good for me to express myself. It is, but it's not nearly just that, right? This is this is speaking to God. God invites us to pray. Psalm fifty: Call on me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you will honor. Um, when we go to God for help, uh, He answers. And then we get to say, you're awesome, God. Um, Give me a place to show what you want. Right, right. And he promises that he's hearing and answering. You know, it's not just, it's not just, hey, if there's anything out there that's listening, but the God of all the universe says, yeah, I got you. I hear you. Um, yeah, First Peter 5, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He got this. Uh, Matthew 10, two sparrows sold for a penny, worthless. Yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from the will of your father. God knows about it all. How much more does he know about you? Even the very hairs in your head. So he, he promises that he's listening. We pray because we have needs. We pray to give thanks. Um, and it does give us hope because it, it's that certainty of knowing he's really listening and he cares. Um, so the next question, how should we pray? When I was a kid growing up, my parents taught me, well, you fold your hands, you close your eyes, you bow your head. Um, I do 
a lot of praying while I'm driving these days. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't want me to fold my hands and close my eyes and bow my head. Uh, while I'm, there are certain times when those postures are good, right? You know, the Bible talks about sometimes praying in public with everybody and sometimes going in a, in a private room in your house and, and praying so that, uh, you know, you're all by yourself with your God. Um, both are good. It's not about a specific ritual or pattern. While those things are helpful, you know, my parents had me fold my hands so I wasn't fidgeting with everything else and getting distracted and closed my eyes so I wasn't looking at everything else and getting distracted. But um, the important thing is, is what's going on in this communication, right? Uh, we pray only to the true God, and right? he's, he's the only one that hears. We pray in the name of Jesus. That's how we have access to him um, through what Jesus has done for us. We pray in a thoughtful and sincere way. You know, there's always the temptation to let prayers become just, well, I got to say these things. Growing up, before every meal, it was, come Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. That was our before meal prayer. And the after meal prayer, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Um, the, the song. There were times when if you translated what I was saying with those words, it was closer to ready, set, go, let's eat. And kind of on the other end too, I'm going to take off. So let me think a little bit and I'm out. Um, I was saying the words, but there were times when that wasn't a conversation with God. Um, you know, and there are those who, who even have practices where, okay, you got to say this prayer seven times and this prayer this many times. If all it is is reciting words, that's not what it's about. You know, Jesus talks about uh, when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans. They think they'll be heard for their many words. Um, he wants that heart to heart talk with him. Uh, we pray in the confidence that God hears us. Uh, we, we pray according to God's will. You know, that, that's a powerful John 5. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Uh, he knows what's best for us, and he, he's going to give us what's best, but he also wants us to be asking for it and holding him to his promises. And then prayer and Bible study go together. I, I talk to a lot of people asking about their relationship with God, and one of the things I often hear, oh, I pray pretty regularly. Um, and then I'll, I'll ask, and, and do you ever listen to God talking to you? And that's sometimes, what are you talking about? Um, well, in his word. So that it's not just a one-sided. Uh, then the more we're in his word, the more things we have to pray for. In the little uh, shaded box there, I put something that has helped me. If I think about when I'm praying, ACTS, that acronym, uh, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. I, I think we kind of have a default of go right to the supplication. I'm going to ask God for this, 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 and this, and then I'm done. Um, you look at the examples of prayer in Scripture, you look at, uh, um, well, it's helpful to, to think of this and, and all the different ways we can pray. So adoration. Think of how many of the Psalms say, God, you're awesome. You do this, you do this, you do this. That's a good thing. For me to speak to him and, and remind myself as I'm praising him with those words of how awesome God is. Confession. I don't deserve to be able to become to God, but I'm a sinner. Um, asking God for that forgiveness. Thanksgiving. Because he has forgiven me. And then the supplication. Okay. Help uh, this person get better and, and help me learn that. And, you know, whatever. Um, to make it, yeah. And again, this isn't a rule. You don't have to do it that way. But it's something that's been helpful to me. Um, so we've got the why, the how, how about for whom should we pray? Loved ones? Loved ourselves. Ourselves, yep. The world. The world. Yeah, even, even the nasty parts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, I have a question about that. Yes. Are you, um, are you supposed to ask someone's permission before you pray? For them, I mean, can you actually pray for the world without their permission? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I think of uh, 
you know, we are, my prayer is me asking God to do something. Um, and if I'm asking God to, to help those people, whether they know it or not, whether they, they want it or not, what God does and what, what's his will is going to be better than even what they know or want. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, Yeah, uh, I'm just trying to think of, of examples. Um, the, the person who's praying that someone that they care about comes to know Jesus, and that person is, is totally fine living without Jesus in their life uh, at, at that time. Uh, they might not think they, they need that, uh, but the person that cares about them realizes how important it is, and so they, they pray for it even, uh, you know, yeah, so it's like just kind of giving it to God, saying, hey, I want this. I think this, I, I, I would like you to help this person or help this. And if he doesn't think it's the right time, then that's up to him, right? Exactly, yep. You know, that, that Matthew 5 uh, says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Um, you know, they're certainly not asking you to pray for them if they're persecuting you. But uh, think about if, if I'm praying for the person that's giving me a hard time, I'm not holding the grudge against them. Uh, I'm I'm being Christ-like there. Um, what what um, I'm sorry. What scripture was that, or what? Matthew the Matthew five forty four. Um, the okay. second one up there on page sixty five. Thank you. Yep, yep. And then I put on there, pray for everyone except those who are already dead. Um, and just to explain that, I'm not saying we can't thank God for the life he gave them or the way that they impacted us or the wonderful things they've done or any of that, or, we, you know, to pray that, that God comforts the, the survivors and all of that. Uh, but what this is talking about, there are some who um, have the practice of once someone has died, they feel like we have to say X number of prayers to get them into heaven. Um, when someone dies, that's between them and God. If they're a believer, they're in heaven. If they're an unbeliever, they're not. And there's nothing that we can do to change that. You know, it's destined for man to die once and then face judgment. That that passage we, we saw before. Um, so I just put that on there to say, okay. Because, yeah, there, there are some who will, you know, um, feel like, oh, if we're not praying for them, if we're not lighting candles for them, they're not going to be. No, they're they're great. You know, the, the believers who have died, um, they're celebrating. Uh, the things that we do here may help us, but we don't have the power to change their status um, once that's all done. Uh, make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Lord's Prayer, I put that on there. We, we say it every, every Sunday in church. Um, Jesus' disciples said, teach us to pray. And he said, here's a way you can pray. Uh, and, and then you, know, you think about the Lord's Prayer, you've got the address, so our Father who art in heaven, uh, the seven petitions, so the seven things we're asking for. I do think it's instructive. You look through those, and one of them is for physical things, right? Give us the day our daily bread. But all the rest are spiritual things. Uh, maybe a, a reminder to me to, to pray for the most important things most. Uh, and then the doxology, praising God, then the kingdom, the power, and the glory for us. So that's prayer. Questions? Next section then deals with worship. You guys have probably all seen different styles of worship. Um, the Bible does not tell us how you have to do it. Right? Um, you know, the uh, a lot of people have come to very different conclusions about the right way to worship. Paul writes, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't let yourself be bound by any laws in that. You know, the, the Sabbath or the new moon or all these things. Those were a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality is found in Christ. We have freedom to worship how we want. And yet he does say some things about it. Um, it's interesting that the words that are translated worship, both the Hebrew and the Greek, both have in them the picture of bowing down. One is, is falling down with your nose to the ground, you know, laying prostrate. The other is uh, 
it, it is kneeling before a ruler type type of picture. Um, there's a, a quote in a book on worship. A lady named Marva Dawn wrote it probably 20 years ago now. Uh, but I, I wrote down uh, a quote that, that struck me. She said, Americans today worship their work, work at their play, and play at their worship. So I think of worship, I mean, the, the etymology of that word, the old English, is to show worth. I'm showing that this is worth something to me. Um, they worship their work. Boy, our whole schedules, and I got to do this, I got to get the overtime, whatever else. They work at their play. Uh, when I grew up, it was uh, um, be back when the streetlights come on and go find pickup games of whatever in the neighborhood, right? Um, but now, well, you need your hitting coach and the batting coach, and you're in three different travel teams and whatever else, or, you know, adults do the same thing where we work at our play, um, but then play at their worship. Um, for many today, worship is uh, entertainment. I'm going to go and sit down, and the pastor better be interesting, and the music better be great, and everybody's got different definitions of what, what great is. Um, but, but when the Bible talks about worship, it's talking about, I'm, I'm praising God. I'm sitting at his feet. It's not, hey, you better entertain. Now, God is good. He gives us wonderful things in worship, right? He gives us his word. He gives us sacraments. And it's a wonderful thing. Um, but let's look at some of those, those truths. The first one, I quoted that before. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. He had, in the Old Testament, he said, here's how you do it. The priest does this. They light those candles. The choir sings that. You know, and it's very laid out. Uh, New Testament, he said, we've, we've been freed from all of that. But he wants it to be done in a fitting and orderly way. Paul wrote to the, the believers in Corinth. He said, you guys, it's chaos. You're getting together and you're shouting over one another. And, and, and some people are getting drunk on the communion line. And, other, and this is just chaos. Everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. That passage was about public worship. Um, worship is primarily focused on God and what he has done. You read the Psalms, the hymn book of the Old Testament. Worship the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation. It's about what God has done. It's not, hey, look at me at what I'm doing, like, like the Pharisee. Hey, I'm glad I'm not like those other people. I pray right and I you know, wear the right things. It's about worshiping God. Um, and if we're talking about God, the big thing he did, well, Jesus, right? He sent his son. So our worship focuses on Christ. Paul wrote, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and the crucified. Um, the, uh, that's what matters. Number five, the church extends through time. So our worship connects us to brothers and sisters who've gone before and those who will come after us. Um, we are part of something much bigger than just the couple hundred people that, that gather here. Uh, you know, when, when we speak the Lord's Prayer, we're saying that with 2,000 years of followers of Christ. When we close with the ironic blessing where God told Aaron, I want you to raise your hands over the people and say this, put my name on them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, that's 3,500 years of people who have been hearing those words. Um, God has this message for us. When we sing the Gloria, we're singing with the angels in Bethlehem and the church has been singing that ever since. Um, you know, there, there's a connection uh, you know, in, in uh, the olden days, you know, like the uh, uh, the communion rail was always a, a half circle, like it is here, you know, the, the half circle. And then the cemetery would be right on the other side of that wall. The picture being, we're up at the Lord's Supper in this family of believers all gathered around the throne. You know, so so this is part of something that's been going on for a while. Now, again, we're free. We don't have to do things the exact way they've been done in the past. But there's something to that connection. And at the same time, God has blessed us with music and the arts and, and artistic people who are able to, to write things and, and make music and, and all of that. And throughout Scripture, we have encouragements to use those things. So, yeah, there's old and new as we worship together. Um, and our worship form should show reverence and awe. Let's read Hebrews 12, 28, so I can take a drink of water. I've been talking a lot. Uh, Sabrina, it's your turn, I think. Okay. 
Which one is it? Hebrews 12, 28. Okay. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Yeah. We're coming into God's presence. Uh, this is this is something powerful. If I if I get a chance to meet the president of the United States, I'm probably going to make sure that I I look okay and that I'm not you know doing something crazy, right? Um, we're coming into God's presence, and so we want to we want to respect that um, that reverence and awe. So because those are the things the Bible says about worship. When we talk about Lutheran worship, we talk about four key concepts. So the first one, let the gospel predominate. Let everything we do be proclaiming the message of Jesus. So in what you hear spoken, in what we sing, you know, the songs we pick are selected for their message because they're talking about Jesus. Uh, hopefully, they're songs that get stuck in our head and when we, we keep thinking through those those messages, the the building we built is designed to communicate something about God. So when we come into that room, uh, the furniture, there's a, a baptismal font reminding us of our baptism, the altar reminding us of the Lord's Supper and God's presence, the candles. I wear a robe. Uh, there, there was a guy uh, that I had visited a couple times inviting and he had, he had watched online and he said, he made the comments, your costumes are pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm like, that's weird, right? We don't go wearing robes, so why do we do it? Um, well, one, you've got centuries of, uh, you know, but it, it's designed to proclaim something, that it's not about me. Uh, it, 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 I'm, I'm covered in the righteousness of Christ. We all are. And when when we're speaking, it's, it's God's word speaking. Uh, yeah, sometimes I face the congregation, sometimes I face the altar. Someone asks me, how can you keep turning your back on us? Um, that's communicating something when we're facing the altar, we're praying to God. When I'm facing the congregation, it's God's word coming from him to you. Now, if, if we don't understand that, if it's just a bunch of ritual, it's no good. It's not accomplishing its purpose. So if there is anything you see in worship, and you're like, why do you do that? Or, or what's that all about in, in the window? Or whatever, you know, whatever it is, um, ask. Because it's designed to communicate something. Uh, and if you ask and I say, I don't know, uh, well, then we should ask, why are we doing that? If, if it doesn't have a purpose. Was, was someone saying something? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, so... Uh, uh, yeah, let the gospel predominate. Let the people participate. This isn't the pastor and vicar show. It's our worship. And so we do have responsive things that are spoken, and we pray out loud, and we we uh, 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 sing the, the message of, of God. Uh, let all of God's gifts be used in worship. There are those that say, you know, no artwork, no instruments, whatever. Now, if those things get in the way of worship, yeah, they're a problem. You know, if the if the musicians become the focal point instead of the message they're singing, um, then it's a problem. But all of it can can carry the message of Christ. So let God just be used, and let the experience of the church be honored in worship. Again, it doesn't mean we have to do things a certain way, but um, let's respect the the bigger part of our family. Um, and and understand that there are things that tie us to them. Any questions on worship? You've probably noticed that our just like um, our secular calendar has has a pattern, right? You know, a uh, day off on Monday is King Day, and and in February we'll have uh, President's Day, and and uh, you know there will be. Uh, it gets warmer in the summer and, and, you know, at Christmas, there are things that mark our year. Same thing with the church year. Uh, we, we wouldn't have to do this, but uh, because it's been working for 3,000 years, because uh, Christians around the world are doing it, it, it might have something to it. Uh, this, this pattern of the, the church year 
where we walk through the whole message of, of the Bible um, from Jesus' birth through his life, his death, his resurrection, and then the life of the church. So the church here has two halves. The first half is the life of Christ, and the second half is the life of the church. Right now, we're in the life of Christ. So we, we had Christmas, and of course, the Advent season leads up to Christmas. It prepares us for that, so that's all part of that. Um, and then Epiphany, where he's revealed to be God's son. And then, then right now we're in that Epiphany season where uh, this last Sunday we saw him being baptized and God saying, this is the one. At the end of the Epiphany season, we'll have transfiguration, God saying, this is the one. And that's kind of the, the theme of all of the Sundays of Epiphany, God saying, that, you know, this is who Jesus is. Uh, and then we get into Lent preparing for Easter. So uh, his sufferings and, and, and what he went through for us. And then he dies and he rises again in the season of Easter, um, celebrating what it means that he rose for us. And then he ascends into heaven. Uh, and then um, Pentecost, he sends the Holy Spirit to jumpstart the, the New Testament church. And that starts the second half of the church year, uh, where we look at the things that God gives to us um, faith and hope and love and, and the message in his word and, and how to how to live that that Christian life. Um, so yeah, we use a three year cycle in the front of the hymnal. You'll see a listing of all the different readings. So each week there's four readings. There's an Old Testament lesson, a psalm, uh, a gospel lesson. So one of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then uh, uh, from one of the letters of the New Testament, uh, and and they're all based on a theme pertinent to the time of the church year we're in. Uh, questions there? You guys okay if I if I go seven minutes over today? Okay. All right. If, what if was the second you, part of the year? So the first half is the life of Christ. The second half is the life of the church. So uh, the blessings that Jesus gives to the church, you know, you'll have themes on uh, faith and and trust and hope and joy and peace and um, you know we'll see the the work the disciples were doing and in, in uh, uh, spreading the gospel and all that kind of stuff and then the end of the life of the church uh, you get some of the end time Sundays you know what's going to happen at the end and then so that's that's as you're getting into November and then it transitions from there to the new church year of uh, next Advent, um, end of November, beginning of December. So, is the Advent or like the Christmas cycle kind of um, not a part of the year? It's like a separate thing. And then the first part is the Easter cycle. And then the second part is the, however you say that word, Pentecost. Yep. Yeah, so so Christmas and Easter cycles kind of cover the life of Christ from okay. his birth, sufferings, death, resurrection. And then so those make up the first half. And then the uh the Pentecost cycle starts on Pentecost Sunday when Jesus sends out the Holy Spirit, um, and the disciples are given the responsibility to to spread the message. Um and then that kind of carries out through the life of the church in the second half. Okay. All right. Awesome. Um, practical tips for worship. People have told me, you know, it's just so boring. Uh, if I'm going there expecting, a, you know, a movie or something like that, okay, maybe it would be boring. But... I always use the example of me watching a football game versus watching a hockey game. I've been to, I think, two or three hockey games in my life. I've never watched more than 30 seconds of hockey on TV. I can hardly skate, and I grew up in Wisconsin. I, I can make it around, but it's not pretty. Yet. There's no way I'm holding a stick. I mean, I've heard someone play hockey. Um, football, I grew up watching. I played all the way through high school and college. I coached for a couple of years. I I, I understand how, uh, you know, the different positions, what they're supposed to be doing and the different defenses and, and the schemes and, and all of that. And as I, even if I don't care anything about those two teams playing, 
I enjoy watching a football game because it's a beautiful thing, right? And you see, oh, and I would do this now, you know, and, and it's very interesting to me because I get it. Hockey, I know there's a rule that you can't hit the puck too far. And, and I, I know, you know, you, you see half the guys jump off the ice and the other half jump back on. And, and, and there's a little box where if you get in trouble, you get stuck there. But I don't know anything about hockey. Um, so for me, watching a hockey game, yeah, they're athletic. They're doing athletic things, but I'll pass, right? Um, which would I rather have worship be like? Um, like hockey, where I just show up because I'm supposed to show up. And, you know, I, like I said, I've gone to two or three games in my life, but it's just because friends were going and, and, you know, it was a social thing. Uh, or would I rather have it be like me watching a football game where, oh, I see what they're doing and oh, they should really do this. The more I'm in God's word, the, the more I'm, I'm studying the word, the more I'm reading the word, the more I'm thinking about what he has done the more I get out of being in worship. It's amazing where, you know, something that you're reading just randomly during the week, all of a sudden something will come out. There's a connection in, in what we're talking about on Sunday. Um, and so I encourage you, come to Bible study. Um, you've made it 12 weeks here, uh, showed up just about every time. And I think most of you have made up the ones that, that you haven't been here. Um, what do you think? Has this been a good thing? Okay. So we should probably never do that again, right? Uh, that's not, right? It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's good because it, it builds our relationship with God. It helps us understand him more and love him more. Um, so let's keep doing that. Uh, now, a new set of this, we're going to go over the exact same thing, starts on Monday, February 5th. You're welcome to jump into that. Uh, I'd encourage you, though, to, to pick another one to say, you know what, I'm going to commit to that one. Whether it's Sundays at 9.15 or Wednesdays at 7 o'clock. Um, the, the Wednesday ones, we walk through a book of the Bible. So if you're saying, you know what, when I read the Bible, I just don't get it. Um, come to Wednesday. We're in 2 Kings, which is uh, um, probably on no one's top five list of you know Bible chapters, but we're talking about what does this mean? What's the story behind this? And what's God teaching us here? And it's really, uh, we get a lot out of it. Uh, but yeah, we just walk through, we'll, we'll do an Old Testament book, then we'll do a New Testament book, and we go back and forth. Um, Sunday mornings, we do topical series. So right now, Vicar is teaching one that he's written on um, our, our own worst enemy. So pride, greed, what's this Sunday? Uh, this Sunday is wanting. Okay. So great, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, um, and talk about what does the Bible say about this? How do we how do we fight these battles? All of that. Um, so that's my encouragement there. Uh, I put on their introduction to Lutheranism. You know, we are abiding grace, evangelical Lutheran church. What does Lutheran mean? Uh, you're probably aware, you know, you hear Baptist, and there's Southern Baptist and Independent Baptist and Reformed Baptist and Fundamental Baptist. There, there's different Baptist groups. Same thing with Lutheran. There are others that use the name Lutheran. Uh, you've come to understand what we teach, right? We believe the Bible is God's word, and we want to go with that for, for everything. Just because the church body uses the name Lutheran does not mean they teach that. We are a member of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Senate. Um, so all of our churches have, have said, yes, we agree on, on this. Um, but then there's also a couple of other Lutheran church bodies, just historically the way names work and all of that. So, so the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, um, is is a really big one. It's a, a conglomeration of several different Lutheran synods all joined together, and they all had slightly different teachings. And so, when they got together, they said, "We'll disagree to disagree." Um, and so, they're kind of on the other end of the spectrum as far as teaching because. When you agree to disagree, you can't agree on anything, and, and you have to accept kind of anything. So if you hear in the news about the Lutherans who are arguing over something that you're like, well, the Bible is really clear on that, but they're fighting about it, that's usually the ELCA. They're, they're the biggest one. Um, and I'm not trying to do this to throw stones. I just want people to be aware that there are differences. Um, so like they would say, uh, their, their seminary textbooks say, 
the Bible contains God's word. You can't say it is God's word, but you can say it contains God's word. It's up to each individual to determine which parts are God's word for them. I don't believe that. Our church body doesn't believe that. We believe the Bible is God's word. So, you know, there's there's the uh, uh, different sides there. And then the Missouri Senate is, is kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, for a hundred years, Missouri Synod and Wisconsin Synod were in fellowship and, and agreed and, and shared props and pastors and everything. Um, but then in the in the sixties, there were some props at their seminary that started teaching, like what the ELCA is, and and then um, long story short, now there are some Missouri Synod churches that are very conservative that would teach just about the same as what we do. And there are some that are closer to the ELCA. So eventually we had to say, hey, we can't we can't say that we're in agreement because there's not consistency and agreement there. Um, but there are talks going on to try to try to figure that out between those 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 church bodies now. Um, but that's just a quick note. Um, you know, if, if you're looking for this teaching, um, you're looking for a member of the Wisconsin Jones. Make sense? Okay. Uh, what is the church? You know, the Bible talks about, uh, uses the picture of the body of Christ. Um, so that this last little part here is on church membership. And I'll let you read those passages, but I'll just say this. Um, when God talks about being a member, he, that word is used specifically because of the picture Jesus uses to describe the church, a body. And our body has many members, different parts. And, and he talks about how, you know, the, the hand is, has a very different thing to do than the nose, which has a very different thing to do than the ear. And because the hand isn't a nose, it shouldn't say, oh, I'm worthless, I'm not going to do anything, because then the rest of the body suffers. And the nose can't say, well, I want to be the ear, but he's been made to be the nose, right? Um, we each are a part of this, an important part. You know, there's no unimportant part of the body. You might say, well, well I don't really need my pinky toe. Well, see what happens if that if that gets injured. Um, the rest of the body hurts. Uh, and if one part of the body says, I'm just not going to do it, the rest suffers. And if one part has, you know, something wonderful happen to it, the rest rejoices with it. You know, and so so being a part of a congregation, a part of a church, is not like joining a health club. January 1, you, you pay your initiation fee or whatever and, and the first four months and, and then see you later. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. It's part of this body. God has put us here. You know, when Jesus was here, he was the way that people saw what God was like. And then Jesus says, I'm going. And now you're my body here. We are the body of Christ. He is the head. We are the body. We are how people see what God is. God looks like, and and we all have different gifts we bring to the table for that. Um, so you've got a, a listing of some of the, the spiritual gifts that are there. Um, but when we talk about membership, so so this serves as our new member class. We ask everybody to take this before they join, because when someone joins, they are saying, we agree, right? God wants us to have unity, and, and so we want to have unity around, you know, understand what we're agreed to. So we do this class. Um, and so this little bit, we'll talk about the requirements for membership um, and the expectations that you should have of your church. Uh, so requirements for membership, you must be baptized into the name of the Triune God because God tells us to be baptized. Um, I'm guessing most of you already have been. If you haven't been yet, talk to me. We can, we can make that happen. Uh, you must declare adherence to all the books of the Bible because, again, we want to have unity. God wants us to have unity, but we, we need to have that based on something. And, and uh, for us, that's the Bible. Uh, you must be familiar with the chief parts of the teaching. That's why we do this. Because everybody says, yeah, the Bible's good, until they find out what it actually says, right? Um, you must be living the faith that's in your heart. Doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect, but it means that you are striving to, to live your life according to God's will for you. You must make a commitment to the ministry of the church, right? The body needs each of its members to do their part. That doesn't mean you're saying, I'm going to do whatever you tell me I've got to do, right? It means you're saying, I'm going to figure out what God has made me, you know? So when I, before, when, when people are getting ready to join, I, I always like to have a meeting with them and I ask them two questions. What body part are you? And what can I be praying for you for? So I'm your pastor. I want to be praying for you. Um, 
So I'll ask you those two questions. And so the first one, what body part are you? Where do you see God using you as a part of this, this body of this work we're doing together? Uh, you must regularly attend worship in the Lord's Supper if physically able, study your Bible at home, attend Bible study if physically able. That's where we are strengthened to, to be what God has made us. All that makes sense? Okay. So then you should also have expectations of your church. The church must preach and teach God's word and all its truth. If you hear something that doesn't seem to agree with God's word, please talk to me. Um, I'm human. I can make mistakes. Uh, I'll promise you that I'll do my best to always give you what God's word says. Uh, but if you hear something otherwise, please let me know. Hold me accountable to that. Uh, the church must guide its people in the truth of word. So give you opportunities like Bible study, chances to ask your questions, chances to grow. Church must pray for its people. I try to regularly pray through the, the roster, but it's nowhere near every day. I have um, I have my little book of prayer requests, and I, I pray the most recent two pages. I try to do that every day. Um, but uh, we also have elders. So there's eight elders this year, uh, and the congregation families are split up between those different elders, and they've each promised to be praying regularly for the people on their list. Um, so, uh, yeah, congregation must pray for its people, must set an example in Christian living. Uh, you've probably heard of churches that split up because the pastor had an affair with the secretary or stole money or whatever else, and half the church says, oh, let's forgive him, and he's still our pastor, and the other half says, no, he can't be our pastor if he did that. Um, and they split, and it gets ugly, and all of that. God has uh, instructions. He has requirements for his leaders. Um blameless above reproach. If if I have done something that brings reproach to God's name. Um, now, you understand I am not perfect. I'm a sinner and I mess up. Um, but if it's something that is public and, and bringing shame to God's name, I don't belong as your pastor. And so we say that now, that's your expectation so that there's never the split. I would, I would hope that you would always forgive me and welcome me as a brother. But I wouldn't belong as the leader. Now, and I'll tell you, I'll do my best not to do any of that. But I'm sure everyone that got stuck in something like that would have said the same thing. Um, but just so that the expectations are clear. Church must visit you when you're sick or in need. Um, you know, on, on Monday, I went and visited a, a young man in prison. Um, we regularly make hospital visits and visits to those who are uh, not able to get out. Um, because... In situations like that, Satan's attacking. We need God's encouragement. So let us know uh, if something's going on, if we can, you know, uh, have an devotion before you go into surgery or, or things like that. Uh, and the church must do whatever is necessary to keep the person in the true faith. So uh, we're asking our church to hold us accountable. Um, you know, if, if someone said, you know what, I just, I'm just going to stop going. Um, you would hope that that your other members and, and your church would say, hey, wait a second, we need you. You need this. Um, and, and hold each other accountable. Um, any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, and then the, the last little bit there, uh, stewardship. You know, the member of the church will be willing to give their time, talent, treasure to the Lord's work to make sure that congregation. Um, we are living in a very materialistic world, a very selfish world, world where what do I want to do what what's best for me God wants us to learn to give first to him of our time our talents and, and even our money I know you know all okay, churches only talk about money well this is the first time money is coming up in the, in this class but um, the Bible does say things about our financial stewardship um, because it is such a temptation God tells us to give to him first help us break that temptation, right? So um, he tells us it should be first fruits, not let me give what's left. Because again, God has given us everything, and it's our way to say thank you and acknowledge that he has. Uh, do it on a regular basis, first day of every week, uh, some of money in keeping with their income. Uh, so he wants to be proportionately. Uh, and Second and Corinthians 9 is really a, a key passage. Um, Peach, you want to read that one? You said 2 Corinthians 9, 7? Yep. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, it's it's not, oh, I've got to do this, but here's my opportunity to get things done. Yeah, so uh, no, we're not gonna have you turn in your W-2s and we'll tell you what, what you should be giving. Uh, that That's between you and God. It should be cheerful. It should be first fruits. It should be trusting all of those things. We do, you know, encourage you, like the Bible says, proportionately. Um, and so, hey, think about what percentage of your income you want to give to God. In the Old Testament, God told them it's 10%. Plus all the offerings and sacrifices of the offering, but first 10%, that goes to God. And so we all, you know, will often say, yeah, that, that might be a good place to start. Just to just to say, um, let's see how this works. And I know you can look at your budget and say, no way can I spare 10%. Um, I've never heard of someone who decided, you oh, know, I'm going to do 10% and then realize and then regretted that, right? Um, God makes things work. Uh, but again, I'm not here to tell you what specific amount you should be giving. Uh, but that God does tell us we should be giving. Uh, any questions on any of that? That's less 11. Next week you'll do nine and then, then you'll be done. Um, what I would like to do is schedule an individual meeting with everybody um, and uh, uh, talk about the class, any questions you had, any things that are, and, and talk about whether you would like to become a member or not. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, maybe uh, kind of think uh, if you want, we can schedule it now. Stick around after. I'll say a prayer and stick around. We can smoke it out. I'll, I'll give you a call next week and, and we'll find a time. Uh, it might even be just the, the next Tuesday or something like that. Sound good? Any closing questions, comments? All right, let's say a prayer then. Lord God, thank you for the opportunity to do this class and to grow closer to one another as we grow closer to you. Strengthen us that we keep uh, studying your word and, and being strengthened in your faith throughout our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.